Hello students! Welcome to the next video in the Pwn College shell coding module. Today we're going to be talking about common challenges that you might face in shell coding. I hope you've seen the previous videos in this module, otherwise this might not make sense. Let's get rolling. Alright, we're going to start with something that is not necessarily a uh, challenge that you'll run into, but more of a hurdle that a lot of people encounter. We're going to talk about sizes of memory accesses. Um, if you recall from the assembly fundamentals le uh, lecture, you can access registers in different sizes. Well, those different sizes uh, have an analog in memory access as well. You can access memory in different sizes as well. So um, in the kind of simple case where you're moving a register into a memory location this uh, move uh, for example this first single byte example will move the least significant byte of rbx into the memory location pointed to by rax these writes are uh, sized according to the um, uh, size of the the register right so that's nice and simple if you write BL, it will write a single byte. BX, two bytes. EBX, four bytes. RBX, uh, eight bytes. Uh, nice and simple. Nothing super crazy there. Uh, sometimes, though, when you're writing, for example, just, just immediate values, constants, uh, things might get a little trickier. Let's say you're writing number five. How, how many bytes is that? Um, technically speaking, you can fit the number five into one byte, but maybe you mean uh, 0005 and, and you want eight bytes or something. Right? In these cases, you can explicitly specify the uh, size of the write to avoid any ambiguity. You can also specify it in the original case um, as well. Um, just keep in mind there are cases such as this. In the bottom case, you, you have to specify on uh, this uh, and the assembler if you don't specify it will complain to you with kind of uh, uh, hard to understand errors now you know how to write memory with certain sizes all right let's move on to actual challenges let's talk about uh, what to do in situations where you can inject shellcode but there are certain values that cannot be present in your shellcode this is actually a very common situation uh, often, as we'll discuss later in future modules, stir copy is kind of a problem child sort of uh, function that leads to buffer overflows frequently. Right? If you're injecting your shellcode with stir copy, then your shellcode cannot contain null bytes because stir copy will terminate and stop copying when it hits a null byte because that's when strings end. Right, so that's uh, one common problem. Another common problem is new lines. If you're talking about something like scanf, gets, get line, f gets, these are also very common unsafe functions that lead to um, uh, overwrites and, and so forth, and they uh, terminate on a new line. And actually, scanf also terminates on a carriage return space tab, what have you. Right. Then there are other kind of special characters like ox7f. Um, in certain protocols is uh, means something special, right? And, 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 and other ones, these are just kind of common ones. Um, so you have to be ready to write shellcode that optimally doesn't include these characters because otherwise your shellcode will get uh, messed up uh, in, in, in uh, you know, uh, transfer basically or in, in one of the right processes or something. Um, so how do you make sure that your um, shellcode doesn't contain these uh, bad characters? Well, there's a lot of ways to express the same thing in assembly, just like there is in C, just like there is in Python. There, there are many ways to do uh, some specific thing you're trying to do. Uh, here are a couple of um, kind of bad to good examples that achieve the same thing. At the top here, we do move RAX comma zero. You want to write zero into RAX. This has a ton of null bytes in it. Why? Because uh, 
move REX zero, it moves a, a 64-bit value into REX. That 64-bit value is five, uh, zero, eight, but eight bytes of zeros, right? Instead, we can replace it in this case with something like XOR REX REX, which just uh, clears out uh, REX, also sets it to zero, and is much shorter. Right, there are actually even shorter forms of that uh, call. You can do X or EAX, EAX, um, which if you remember the assembly fundamentals lecture, also zeroes out the most significant bytes of REX as well. But that's one example, right? Let's say you wanted to actually move some uh, value to REX. Um, you can, you still can, right? If you do move REX5, you have the same problem. It's just one of those null bytes uh, one of those, uh, you know, many bytes of nulls is now a five um, instead of a null, and but the rest are still null bytes. So you still have this problem. Well, you can of course zero out REX and then move five into just AL, right? Nice and simple there as well. Um, you move five into AL, so that then REX has just zero, 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 five. Um, very simple. Um, all right. Let's say uh, you want to move uh, another, another way to do things. Um, if you are trying to avoid not zeros, but a new line, for example, and you want to move 10 into REX. 10, also known as in hexadecimal as OXOA, uh, is the new line character in ASCII. So this is a big problem if you have a scanf or, or some other analogous way of injecting your shellcode. Um, it will terminate the read on that new line. Um, but that's okay. You can instead move nine into it and then increment REX. Or you can XOR it, XOR REX, REX, and then do ink 10 times or some, anything along those lines. There are a lot of different ways to do this that avoids having a literal 10 uh, in your, in your uh, shellcode, uh, literal new line. All right, final uh, one, the fourth thing here. Um, if we want to uh, move the flag value into RBX or slash flag, the uh, a path to a string, and there it has null bytes in it. Um, and this is, you know, it would not be reasonable to XOR REX REX and then have, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of ink REX uh, shellcode, obviously. Well, we can do something different. We can move. Um, just uh, the word flag backwards, this is little endian, yeah, into um, EBX. Then we shift EBX to the left by eight bits, and then we move in to the uh, least significant byte that just cleared up the forward slash. And then we end up with backwards this forward slash um, flag, right? Then when we write it to memory or whatever we do, we'll have slash flag, right? So we built the value. We can build it in many different ways and we can use different instructions even if the instruction itself is causing a, um, uh, a, a problem for us. Um, for example, if you can't use XOR, there are other instructions that you can use that do similar things, right? Um, there are tools that'll do this automatically for you. I would recommend especially as you learn shellcode, and especially in this homework, don't use them. They don't always work. And when they don't work, it's not clear if it's your shellcode that's incorrect or these tools that are trying to uh, make your shellcode pass certain constraints are incorrect. You end up spending insane amounts of time debugging. I wouldn't recommend it. Just write your shellcode and figure out how to bypass um, these uh, whatever constraints that you have, whatever bytes you can't uh, use and so forth by hand. All right, rolling on. Um, you might run into a situation where certain instructions are simply forbidden or where there are constraints where it's very hard to uh, get around them and still have functional shellcode. Well, remember, in a uh, von Neumann architecture, code and data are the same thing. And oftentimes, by the time you're writing shellcode, you have a region that you were able to write to and then are able to execute. So you have writable code. This is important. You can do very clever stuff. So let's say, um, for whatever reason, I forbade 
int3, the debug um, opcode in shellcode or whatever, the, the vulnerable program wouldn't accept that. Or there was a constraint applied somewhere along the line that would um, negate it. And you really need to use int3. Int3 in assembly, in uh, binary, is cc, the byte ox cc uh, in hexadecimal. Um, so what you can do is write a byte cb and increment it. And that's exactly what this little snippet does. It increments the uh, instruction pointed to by the instruction pointer, which is going to be the next instruction to execute, increments it, and then it'll execute. Um, uh, you'll have to make sure when testing this that you're, uh, if you're using the, the shellcode running and testing method that we talked about uh, earlier in this module, you'll have to make sure that you compile your shellcode with the dot text segment being writable. That's important. Um, otherwise, by default, it is not. It's readable, um, and then it's it's a pain in the butt. So you can uh, do this right here. This dash capital W lowercase l comma dash n capital W l uh, tells GCC to pass this option to the linker, and this option does a number of things that, as a side effect, makes a writable text segment. And then you can do this sort of thing. Of course. At execution time, usually, frequently, your shellcode is writable, but not always. All right. What else can you do? Um, well, if constraints in your shellcode uh, are, are so hard that you just can't get a, a system call um, out, or that you can't achieve whatever goal you want your shellcode to achieve, you can always... Um, uh, load more shellcode. Not always, but frequently you can load more shellcode, right? This is called a multi-stage shellcode. You have stage one that reads in stage two. So let's say that you had stage one and you could just barely create a stage one shellcode that could call read from standard input into the buffer pointed to by the instruction pointer, which will be the next instruction to execute of uh, a thousand bytes. If you manage to execute that and your shellcode is writable, um, then you can um, you would read in more shellcode directly in front of the instruction pointer and have it execute. Right. Uh, that's a pretty good way of bypassing complex filters. Um, and in this uh, assignment, you will likely have to do that. Um, just as a quick note for. Uh, um, this sort of thing is kind of hard to do, harder to do on different architectures. On x86 32-bit, it's a pain in the butt. I mean, it's doable, but it's, it has its, its caveats. On AMD64, this is actually super easy. You can load effective address of the memory pointed to by the instruction pointer into RAX, for example. Super easy. I guess in this case, we'd want it to be loaded into R RSI. All right. Cool. Um, so that is um, how you would bypass, let's say, a, a really hard filter that makes it very difficult to do uh, reasonable things. So instead, you can try um, to just write smaller shellcode that reads in your bigger real shellcode. All right. Um, finally, just a note on shellcode mangling. Um, your shellcode might be pretty uh, messed up and unrecognizable, um, a challenge uh, might sort your shellcode, right? That This is uh, something that, generally speaking, will likely only happen in uh, shellcoding challenges. But uh, I've seen uh, shellcode that had to be written in a way that the data you provided is first uncompressed and then that results in shellcode execution, right? So the shellcode um, has to not really survive compression, uncompression, but your data when uncompressed has to be your shellcode. Uh, it might be encrypted or decrypted with some key, uh, a lot of different uh, things that, that could happen. My advice to you is um, to start backwards. Think about what do I want my shellcode to look like when it executes? And then think, okay, now, what do I have to provide to the program to make that happen? Just step by step, right? If the program uncompresses your shellcode 
and you want your shell code to execute after being uncompressed, you start with your shell code and you compress it. Right? That's fairly straightforward, but it's uh, a small concept that, that is sometimes tricky to wrap your head around. All right. Um, final thing I'll mention, there are times when your shell code cannot directly talk to you. All the file descriptors are closed or um, your shell code is actually running on some embedded device in a power plant somewhere because you're launching some crazy attack that you shouldn't be. Um, how else can you communicate the flag, right? If you don't have a, a direct connection back to yourself. There are a lot of uh, different ways. They're very situational dependent, of course. But the general idea is if you can communicate one bit of information, then you can communicate. Right? Just one bit. And that one bit could be the program hung or it didn't hang, the program crashed or it didn't crash, or any other uh, large amount of things that, that, that you could convey from your shellcode back to, uh, to your, um, the observer. Of course, in very remote scenarios, it can be stuff like DNS lookups. It can be a lot of uh, different things. Um, but that's out of the scope of this module. But you will need to understand this concept to pass all of the challenges that we're launching. All right, useful tools for shellcode writing and debugging. Um, I mentioned Rappel already um, in the assembly fundamentals, and I uh, sent the link, or I had a link to the AMD64 opcode listing. That's very useful to see what um, uh, instructions you can use given certain constraints. I had a couple other ones. Pwn Tools is a very nice library, uh, not just for writing the exploits in shellcode, but also for uh, launching and, and interacting with the vulnerable program. Right? It's very uh, good for that. I highly recommend using it. Um, Pwn Tools has shellcode that it, uh, it can generate for you. I would recommend not using that for this assignment. It'll work for the first couple of levels, but it's going to do you a big disservice uh, afterwards when you kind of hit a wall on levels we can no longer solve. Um, finally, for debugging your source, your shellcode, uh, obviously you will learn to love GDB. Um, GDB is a little easier to love if uh, you customize it just a little bit. There are several plugins that make GDB better. Um, I rec highly recommend one of these. I'm most familiar with Pwn Debug at this point, um, but PETA has its adherence and uh, Pwn GDB has its adherence. Um, pick one and uh, install it to make GDB much, much simpler, uh, much easier to use. You can actually, even if you want, install it inside um, that uh, container for the challenge problems. Um, set it up and then uh, it'll stay around because your home directory is persistent. Awesome. That is all I have for shellcode challenges. Good luck on those assignments.